for example, like Cosmolito, you need to just drop that fly within 30 feet to 15 feet in its general direction where it can see it and then strip as fast as you possibly physically can. I What I do a lot of the times is I would start step, taking steps backwards to if I don't have enough speed on my fly and then just boom and it just destroys the fly. And uh, something that also sometimes happens uh, is that a client would rod strike or a, or a person would rod strike that's not used to it, a, a trout strike that's not used to it. But with these fish, you we kind of prep them and tell them you have to rip its face off. That was Yaku Lucas talking about what it takes to hook up with a giant trevally on the fly. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before I get into the intro, I want to remind you to leave a quick comment on the blog post for this episode at wetflyswing.com slash yaku. That's J-A-K-O. This lets me uh, know you are out there listening and enjoying the conversation. Today in this episode, I have uh, Yaku Lucas, one of the big names in saltwater fly fishing around the world. Yaku talks about his experience guiding in the Seychelles for GTs, how to DIY it in Sudan, Christmas Island, and Wyclef Sean. We talk about gangsters of the flat and some of the other videos that have won awards for him over the years. Don't miss this as he talks about some of the best resources to put together your next saltwater trip, plus some of the gear he uses uh, and doesn't leave without it. So, without further ado, here's Yaku Lucas from CaptainJackProductions.com. How's it going, Yaku? Hi there, Dave. Uh, it's, uh, it's going good. Thank you so much for the, for the invite for the show. And uh, yeah, um, looking forward to, uh, to a good chat about some, uh, some, some good fly fishing out there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, get into this conversation. Um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about saltwater on this show, and I know you've fished all over the place, including, you know, fresh and saltwater, but I think we're going to focus a lot on, you know, how you got to where you are and kind of the producing the videos and fishing, it seems like, all over the world. But um, before we get into that, maybe you can just talk about how you got into fly fishing and how um, Captain Jack Productions all came to be. Um, yeah, well, it's, uh, it, it ends up being quite a long story, but I'll try and put it in a nutshell. Um, I mean, I was born and raised with a dad that, uh, and a granddad that, that fishes a lot. So growing up on the beaches in South Africa, uh, with him saltwater fishing and, uh, grew, grew up fish, starting to just, uh, fish for sharks on the beach. And, uh, as, as the years progressed, I, uh, in, in, uh, in the last year of primary school, I picked up a fly rod and kind of at that point, I immediately, made the decision that I would uh, would uh, love, love to try and catch whatever fish I can on a fly rod. Um, not being snobbish about tackle or fishing at all, I still love it and I think you learn a lot from it. So uh, so I still like to go to the beach with my dad and go and catch sharks and uh, as big a fish as I possibly can. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just uh, during my last years of high school, I met a, a, a guy called Keith Rosinas that's the, the managing director of uh, the the Alphonse fishing company that mm-hmm. runs four of the islands in the Seychelles and uh, um, kind of asked him how he does what he's doing. And he just came back from a season in Russia and uh, he told me how, and uh, I made sure to finish my degree first, uh, went to go and work in a fly shop in London and, uh, and then phoned him up uh, after a year and said, look, I've done everything you said I needed to do and I need a job now. And uh, he, two weeks later I was in Cosmeda, one of the craziest GT fishing places in the world. And, and then it kind of just progressed from there. I loved uh, guiding people. It's, it's still every day I, I love doing it. And then I uh, just started picking up a camera, trying to create these uh, or just keep the memories because every I think every single moment that we spent out in a location is something you'll never be able to recapture. It's it's that moment and that's done. It's, it's not like you can quickly take it again. So it was nice to just starting photos and videos and, and then just introducing people to new species. And it kind of just slowly progressed from there and uh, – and uh, then Captain Jackson, Captain Jack Productions was created, and uh, people kind of liked it. It's not the best cinematography or anything like that, but it uh, it gets people in, excited about fly fishing, which is the main goal, and mm-hmm. getting more young people in the sport. Yeah. So that's uh, definitely. I think there's a bright future for fly fishing, and uh, but it's up to us to create that uh, excitement in the in the youth. Yeah, 
Yeah, for sure. And you've, yeah, your videos are awesome for sure. You have like, oh, lots of uh, different species you're hitting and, and the music and stuff. And I wanted to get into a little more on the videos. Um, but before I jump into that, uh, you mentioned guiding and, and getting your start, getting uh, started with fishing for sharks. I mean, what do you, uh, is there anything you learned from fishing for sharks and you still do with gear? Is that uh, a lot different from fly fishing? Um, I think the key element with all fishing is what you do learn um, is you learn how to read water and you learn how to read conditions and how the fish behave and obviously just the normal general things like if I was fishing in Jeffrey's Bay with my dad, I knew if we had two days of easterly wind and the westerly comes over, then it's then the easterly made the water dirty, which brought in the small fish, which brings in the big fish. And then when it turns westerly, it flattens that ocean a little bit, but it keeps it that color and and that dirty water with the, and so, and then you go out and you look for prime spots where the sharks would come in and leave. So e- even if you, if you lobbing out a big bait and you're waiting for a 500 pound shark to pick up your bait, it's, uh, it's, it's still all about reading the water because you could stand there for days. If you're not in the right spot at the right, uh, with the right, right, right weather conditions and water conditions. So, um, you, you learn, and I learned so much from, from all of that. And then with with fly fishing, you just start refining a little bit more because now you're using something artificial, um, and and you 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 just start using using a lot of the different elements, and it it slowly comes together. But it, that's what I like about it. It's it's it keeps you on your toes. You're thinking the whole time, and um, and you never know it all. That's mm-hmm. the one thing that I've always said to anybody. It doesn't matter how long you died, how long you've been out on, on a specific place. You see something new every day, and you need to be open to learn. Um, if you close yourself out and become arrogant, then you're just going to get nowhere. So just keep an open mind and, and enjoy every moment of it. So uh, you mentioned uh, the Seychelles and you fished all over the, uh, feels like all over the world out there. But maybe you can talk a little bit about the Seychelles and what that's all about in that experience. It's it's kind of a, t- a tiny or a cluster of islands out there in the middle of the Atlantic, right? Yes. I mean, the Seychelles... Um, I mean, it's at the end of the day, fly fishing Nirvana. Um, it's uh, it's definitely far out there. Um, it gets it gets fished by very few people. Technically, if you think about it, even the islands that gets fished, uh, Alphonse that get fi- get fished quite regularly during the season. I mean, there's still only a handful of people that get to fish it in a week's time. Um, but I mean, then you look at places like Cosmolito and Astove and uh, Farquhar, Providence, um, all those places. It's uh, it's it. I mean, it's all, all still relatively new to, to fly fishing. I mean, it's been around now for, uh, for, for it seems like a long time, but, um, but uh, it's, still, it's still reasonably, uh, um, I, well, I suppose it's just because it's so far that there's not a lot of people that go fish it. But um, I mean, the more places that I fish around the world now, the more I realize like, how amazing the fishing is at those places. The, the thing is, is again, like, um, like I said before, is that, uh, people kind of at the end of the day, because of all the movie stuff with the GTs and stuff, get the GT fever. But yeah. there's just so much other stuff that those places have to offer. And and each little island almost has its own characteristics. For example, Cosmolito has – it's the GT capital of the world. And then you have – um, then you have a place like uh, Farqua, which has lots of bumphead parrotfish. Then you get Alphonse, which has got lots of milkfish. And then you mm. get uh, Poiv, which has got lots of permits. So um, they all have all the same species at the end of the day, but they all have mm-hmm. one that's a little bit more uh, 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 more in bigger numbers than than the, than the other species. So so it's very unique. And I always tell any client that fishes with me on the flat or when I go fishing on the flat that just keep an open mind catch anything that swims in front of you yeah. and uh if that that time comes for a gt you'll get a gt but hmm. you know still at the end of the day as, as spectacular as those places are um conditions and weather and stuff also still play a role so yeah it's kind of sad sometimes to see when the guys travel 40 hours to get to this place and you get a whole day of rain or at least a couple of rain schools coming through and your visibility is bad and you're oh, struggling yeah. to see fish so it's it's still it's it's amazing and it's a very untouched environment, but still conditions that just shows you how conditions play a role in in fishing. And then you're still trying to do it with a fly rod, which that means you need to fish within a certain range. You need to make sure that he's happy and and all of that uh, element. So, but it is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it 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 is spectacular. 
Okay. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. What's the, uh, so what do you consider your kind of your home, uh, water or your home area or, or do you, you know, do you have a species that you fish for most often? Um, well, in, I, I spent so much time at one stage, uh, just, uh, six months or seven months in the Seychelles, then Norway, then Mongolia. And that at one stage was just, I mean, that was the places that I was spending most of my time at. But I would have, I would have said that the last uh, more than a decade has probably been the Seychelles. And, and again, I, I get the question very often about uh, what my favorite species is. And, you know, again, I, I, like I said, I, I'm a fish slut. I'll catch anything mm-hmm. that swims in front of me. But if I, if I had to pick one fish that, that's, that still astounds me every time it takes the fly is, is still a GT. I mean, just seeing that aggression, just seeing how it, it can come from, from miles away to come and eat the fly. It is, it is phenomenal. Huh. So, so how does it feel when, you know, when a, when a G, what's that whole experience? So you're out there and you see the fish or, you know, can you just take us through that whole, what that whole feels like when you hook up? Um, yeah, it's, it, it always catches anybody uh, by surprise the first time they get it. The uh, kind of the client says that, uh, that, oh, damn moment every time they, it happens. But I mean, you try and prep them. Uh, you, you could, a lot of the times we'll be looking for stingrays or sharks and the GTs would be cruising with them. So they've got this symbiotic relationship where the one helps the other feeding or, um, or the GT would just be with the sharks and, and feeding off whatever it's hunting. But, uh, or using it as camouflage. So you'll be looking for those signs or channels going in and out. And basically you'll see the fish from hope normally quite a distance away and just position yourself. A lot of clients would slowly then move towards the fish, but you some, you, a lot of times you have to hustle. These fish are moving to go and eat something and they with something that wants to go feed. So there's always movement involved. So you just need to position yourself usually at a place, for example, like Cosmolito, you need to just drop that fly within, 30 feet to 15 Hmm. feet in its general direction where it can see it and then strip as fast as you possibly (laughs) physically can. I, what I do a lot of the times is I would start steps taking steps backwards to if I don't have enough speed on my fly and then just boom. And it just destroys the fly. And uh, something that also sometimes happens uh, is that a client would rod strike or a a person would rod strike. That's not used to a, a, trout strike that's not used to it but with these fish you we kind of prep them and tell them you have to rip its face off so you have to set that hook as hard as possible and sometimes the guys don't believe me but once you land a fish i I sometimes ask them to take the fly and try and put it in the fish's mouth and you can see how hard that mouth is so it's so it's so important that you just keep that keep that rod down just Mm. set it and just hold tight and um with gt's you, you you can reach that point where you can break its spirit so the quicker you stop it the the the, the less chance you have of losing it. Those big, big GTs can sometimes, if you can stop it, it from keeping its head down and swimming away from you, you can, you've got a good chance of landing a hundred to 120 Jeez. pound GT. But if you don't stop it in that initial point, then you are dead in the water. Then wow. he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna destroy you and your <laughs> tackle. And that's why whenever we tell clients, okay, they ask us, what do we need to rig up for? We go 12 weights, 130 pound straight leader. Uh, 80 pound to 100 pound core fly line you got to be ready for battle i um i mean i've seen a line it was quite a little bit of a dangerous moment but i've seen a client hit a fish and the line bounce up around his neck and started dragging oh. the guy sort of Jeez. towards the flat luckily we got everything loose <laughs> but i mean that's holy cow that's uh that's that's uh it's it's very exciting i mean i've seen the gts eat rod tips off coming that close to eat the fly um it's it's nuts it's uh huh. it's mind blowing this is awesome. Now I'll, I'll leave. Um, I know you have some links out there. I was watching a few videos you had out there of some of the uh, strip sets, and it was it was amazing stuff. So all uh, at wetflyswing.com slash yaku. That's uh, J A K O. That I'll have all the show notes there with some links to your videos and stuff like that. And um, awesome, Should yeah, be fun. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is really cool. I uh, so I think GTs. I mean, maybe there isn't a good answer for this, but I'm always thinking of like the the DIY do it yourself sort of thing. And I know there's some places where you know it's easier and harder. But is there any place where GTs you can actually do that? I mean, maybe that involves getting a guide or getting information. But or, or is it something that you pretty much need to pay for the the full big trick trip expense? 
Um, with regards to, let's say they're Se- Se- Seychelles, um, un- unfortunately for the DIY angler, the only place is my my, which is the main island, which is which uh, which I haven't honestly myself caught a GT around near that island. I can't say that I've tried hard enough. There mm-hmm. is other potential things to catch around the main island, but uh, the Seychelles is is. Uh, is definitely worth getting an operator to go and fish there. And I understand it's a lot of money, but um, but if you save up or you plan that dream trip and go do it, you won't regret it. But yep. uh, we do have places in South Africa where a lot of uh, where a lot of guys like Cozy Bay or Mozambique, where where guys will go cut their teeth on on GT fishing. Look, I mean, honestly, if you have a chance at a GT, that's a that that's good enough. Um, but you could catch a really nice GT off the beach. It's a little bit more different than what we do. It's not really sight fishing. It's more blind fishing in oh, the yeah. surf. Um, and then there's the Maldives. I think have become very reasonable uh, in pricing. A place like Sudan, which I went to recently mm-hmm. this year, it's it's very well priced, and and you definitely. Uh, apart from the GTs, there's uh, there's a bunch of other stuff, including probably the best trigger fishing in the world. But um, there's definitely places that's getting a little bit more affordable um, if you if you're willing to rough it a little bit um, yeah. more, which and I know a lot of DIY anglers are willing to do. You could go places to like Oman and uh, go fish the beaches there. Again, it's all going to be very tough, and you need to pre- prepare yourself for possibly not catching one, but you yeah. need to be ready every single moment when the opportunity comes. Exactly. Um, so, uh, so definitely, I mean, there, there is options, but definitely make sure that you, uh, that you research the area. Um, and if you could possibly get a guide, that's obviously first price. Yeah. Um, the guys spend a lot of time out there and they know the place and they'll, they'll give you your best possibility. Um, but again, it's not in everybody's pocket. I know, like I, I, I honestly like. I mean, I, I don't come from a very uh, rich family, but uh, like I said, if you keep dreaming and you and you put your head down, you can make all that stuff happen. Yeah. No, I was thinking too. You know, potentially where someone might want if they had the time and you know, you know, to to move somewhere for maybe li- go there for a few months, you know, or whatever, and just kind of kind of a long extended vacation where, yeah, I think a guide is a great way to get started and then maybe you can kind of go from there. But, um, yeah, there's lots of different ways to do it, but I think it sounds like there are some opportunities. I mean, bottom line is this is uh, something that it sounds like, you know, everybody should try. So however you do it, I think that's the important thing is to get out there and give it a shot. Um, for sure. And, and one thing that I can say to everybody is, is that, uh, I've had the opportunity now in the last several years to also fish for Jack, Jack Ravel, um, oh, yeah. uh, around the U S coastline. And please do not think they, every bit as much as a GT fair enough. They don't grow as big as GTs can grow, but pound for pound, they just as strong as a GT. Huh. They eat aggressive. I've never understood why people call them trash. I would fish for <laughs> them all day long. Okay. Um, now that I live on the uh, close to the Texas coastline, it's going to be uh, some of my bread and butter guiding with uh, redfish. So, so it's uh, it's it's if you have the chance to fish for jacks, you're going to get a good fix as you yeah. would with GTs. But when you get the opportunity, oh, another place that we didn't mention is Christmas Island. That's another oh, yeah. place that I, I know a lot of people have been getting mm-hmm. the opportunity and uh, less expensive and and easier accessible. Hmm. Yeah. No, that is another ever. A friend that was, I think, has been down there a couple of times. That's a, a good one for sure. So maybe, and you mentioned yeah. um, being able to just get out there and catch whatever you, you know, you, whatever is in front of you. Are there any just general other saltwater fishing tips that you would you would give somebody that's that's uh, going to be out there or getting ready for a trip, um, you know, for some saltwater fishing? Uh, like I said, uh, the the thing is, is I I know that um, and myself too. You go to a specific place with a specific goal, maybe a specific fish that you want to catch, but but be sure to to just see what other species there are available, um, and and that could fill up your day. For example, you could hunt uh, a rooster fish in Baja, uh, but but there could be jacks around. There could be other other fish. We even saw milkfish. Uh, just just try for whatever is around in that specific. Uh, uh, time to just to fill up your day because you never know what might happen you, you could catch a bunch of other fish and you could still end up with the fish that you went to, to go target mm-hmm. and that was the funny thing particularly with christmas island in the seychelles we started fishing for trigger fish right from the beginning this is 15 well i mean 20 years ago and uh for some reason nobody really targeted them as much in christmas island and it seems to become more popular now because people realize they sight fishing they they for me a whole day consists of seeing fish 
uh, not necess- and trying to target them. So I, I can go a whole day, see 40 trigger fish and maybe catch one and still have an awesome day because I've been yeah. looking, seeing fish tail. Um, and never, never, like I said, never get snobbish about any kind of fish. I, I know it's the weirdest thing. I, I've seen people rip flies away from beautiful bluefin trevally because they want to catch DT and oh, not catch it. And it's so, so bizarre, you know. Yeah. You just, yeah, it's it's terrible to see, but uh, I suppose different strokes for different folks. But uh, just yeah. catch whatever's there and enjoy the trip in its full. Don't uh, don't obsess about one thing in particular. Yeah, no, for sure. That's another good uh, another good tip there. And now you mentioned you've been guiding for now. How long have you been guiding? So I started in two thousand and six um uh, early 2006 and uh kind of well i started a little bit before that but full-time from 2006 and uh and been almost full-time since then i've started slowing down a little bit now doing more hosted trips exploratory trips and stuff um but my 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 heart still lies with guiding I, i love guiding and and uh hopefully soon enough i'll be ready to to uh start guiding the texas coastline and uh and have and help create some dreams out there. Yeah. Yeah. For uh, guiding, I've, I've interviewed a lot of, uh, guides on here and I've heard all sorts of different stories. Do you, do you remember that first, um, you know, that first guided trip or that first season and what that felt like for you when you first got into it? You know, it's, 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 uh, I, I, I went there honestly, like a sponge. I, I was, I was there to just soak up as much information I can from my head guides. I was going to listen to every single word that they say. Um, I mean, you have sleepless nights because you're so excited to go out on the water. You stay up after the clients have gone to bed to fish yourself a little bit. Um, you know, you, you, you really, it's, it, I mean, it's a dream job. Hmm. Um, I've had seasons where, you know, you spend six months on an island and the guides become twitchy because the only people you interact with is clients and your guide friends. And that's where team team building comes in big time. But uh, And then when things go wrong, motors break and you have to do this and stuff that, you know, it's not all just guiding and having the fun and stuff. Then you just then I just realized sometimes, look, I mean, my, my office is the Seychelles. Um, I've, I'm doing my dream job and – Every job you're going to go do at the end of the day is going to have its pros and cons, but I'd yeah. rather have it out there than have it in the office doing something I, I don't love. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. <laughs> you um, So on those videos we uh, we mentioned earlier, and you have a bunch of great ones out there. Can you explain what, um, you know, for somebody that hasn't seen your videos, what, what sort of stuff you have out there and talk a, a little bit about, and the music too kind of comes with it. Maybe you can speak to how you get into choosing the the music and just putting together the, the whole production. Yeah, look, honestly, I mean, uh, when it comes to my production stuff, there's a, they, uh, it's, it's not, it's kind of sometimes, uh, shoot and hope and and i go there with not the 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 biggest plan on what what the outcome is going to be because fishing is fishing and things can go really wrong so um i i I have recent more recent years started going with a shot list just to have an idea of what i wanted to do but because storylines are becoming so important now with uh, all the camera stuff available a lot of people can shoot good stuff it's now about the Mm storyline but the, the key element for me about the fly fishing movies is about uh trying to um trying to uh grow fly fishing um it's uh it's it's about uh, maybe introducing somebody to something new taking them to a place that they might not immediately go but create a dream um and and definitely the key element that i've always focused on is just trying to get young people in the sport it's it's you know i've watched all the really good snowboarding movies or skiing movies uh the art of flight the fourth phase all the the amazing ones and and that's kind of that element that I would like to in the future see more in, in fly fishing. And there's a lot of production companies, Feltzol Media and Tollwag and, and guys that are next level and BRD Outdoor Productions that have been doing that kind of stuff now, um, which is amazing to see because what we're trying to tell the younger guys is that this is actually a pretty cool thing to do. And uh, the same goes with the music. I think uh, in a movie, uh, the music plays as much with your emotions as what somebody's seeing. So if you drop a cool beat or something and people get into the vibe, it's, it's, it, it gets, it gets their heart racing and, and, uh, you know, music, 
it's difficult now. Uh, there's obviously a lot more laws on using commercial music, which I can understand because at the end of the day, the artists that make that music also deserve what they what they've been working for. So, um, and you know, sometimes for me, it's not about. I mean, for me, the production stuff is literally about growing it. So, if I can use a cool piece of music uh, with some fishing stuff and people enjoy it, that's that's the main goal. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where it's going, and and you see it more often now with the. I mean, the Lost Cosmo movie that the guys did or the uh, the 120 Days with David Mangum, uh, the music in there and just creating those emotions and, and just being awesome and cool. And, and, and yeah. I mean, any any person would think that that's cool. And I, I really like to see that more often and, and it's happening. So I also think that, you know, there, there's, there's still – when I say that I, I think – like wearing a flat cap or wearing some trendy clothing to go fly fishing is still cool, but you still need to remember who the mentors of people are that's been laying the foundation for us to do this stuff. So never forget that. That's very mm-hmm. important. Um, but then help create that next uh, next group of legacy people that that people can look up to. So, and I think we're on the on the point there where it's where it's kind of us now that have to create that and keep keep the sport, keep the momentum going and, and keep building it. Yeah. That's uh no, I was thinking as you were talking there about the, the music, I was watching one of your videos. I think it was, um, oh, it was, I think it was white cleft for the refugee all-stars kind of that staying alive. I'll, I'll, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave a, I'll leave a link to the video and, and the tune and stuff. And, uh, like I mentioned at, um, uh, wetflyswing.com slash, uh, Yaku J A K O. But, um, yeah. So on that one, did you have to get, I mean, how does that work? Do you, do you have to get the rights to play that? Or is that something that you don't really have to worry about? Look with that. Um, I, I do have a lot of people ask me about the questions with, with that. Uh, I would, because it's not, uh, because I'm not creating a specific income out of that specific clip. Uh, oh, usually, yeah. Um, if you're not selling it or anything like that, you should be able to use some music because at the end of the day, that means it's kind of just a fun video that you're making, whether it's uh, one with your family or one with your dog or whatever it may be. So, so then it's just, uh, but, but once you start doing movies for the fly fishing film tours and stuff, then you have to start, uh, purchasing music and it's definitely, uh, uh, it, you know, the funny thing is, is I've seen it uh, with other movie makers too. It literally takes you weeks on end to find the song that you like yeah. and then you just i i edit around it like i want yeah. that beat to show this and that so it takes forever but it's um yeah it's a it's a it's a lot of fun yeah that's a that was a uh yeah no that makes that makes sense so i guess yeah if you were to mm-hmm. toss it on youtube and have ads on on youtube then that'd be a different story but um most of your stuff yeah. is, is a yeah. lot of your stuff on vimeo or is there, there you kind of do it on youtube and vimeo or where do you, where do you um, I have host? a channel where? on YouTube and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yep. Um, I've, I've got a channel on Vimeo and on YouTube, uh, but honestly I do like, uh, Vimeo. Um, I've got Vimeo on demand where I do, um, sell some of my movies to, which I, I mean, that's honestly not something that I was planning on doing. Um, it's just been the cyber world that we've lived in that, uh, that unfortunately, uh, content gets stolen and used, yeah. uh, in ways that, didn't receive permission and stuff. So that's the only reason I thought, well, I might as well, if somebody's going to steal it, they, I can try and at least get some bucks out of them. Right. Um, but, uh, but otherwise I, I mean, if anybody even wanted to watch them, like, I mean, they can also just email me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy on, on, on if they cool, if they happy with, if they want to watch it, I'll, I'll send it to them. Um, because I just want people to see it at the end of the day anyway. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I do like to use Vimeo and then, uh, if there is on YouTube, but I, I honestly haven't paid enough attention on, on YouTube, which I suppose might have a, have a bigger, uh, viewer base, but, uh, mm-hmm. Vimeo is, is great. Yeah. Vimeo. Yeah. Vimeo yeah. is pretty, pretty nice. You mentioned, uh, mentors a little bit ago, thinking back on your life and you're fairly young. How, how old are you now? Uh, I'm 35. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're, I mean, definitely as far, and you've been guiding for, I think you said 12 years. So, um, uh, you know, I want to, want to get into, um, the mentors you've had a little bit and, and, and does that, you know, are there other people who else is doing this stuff? I mean, it seems like your name is out there. I'm not sure if that's because of the videos you're producing, but are there other, are there others out there doing, doing what you're doing, uh, similar sorts of things as far as the video production and salt, and then maybe you can talk a little bit about your mentors throughout your life. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes to fishing itself, mentors, there's, uh, there, uh, I mean, obviously my dad, my granddad will, will always be come up first because they, the guys that that started me, that made me love mm-hmm. the sport, um, and then obviously in within fly fishing. I mean, uh, legend Lefty Cray, Flip Pellet, Chico Fernandez, mm. Dale Perez. I mean, those guys, uh, uh, animals. I mean, the, the names go on, and they, they've really pioneered all these fisheries, which, you know, sometimes you think, oh, man, we've caught this fish for the first time. And those guys actually did it if you start looking into their archives. So they, mm. and, and you need to pay a lot of respects to them and, and what they, they've done. And, um, you know, when it comes to the filmmaking stuff, uh, RA Biardi was definitely. The, I have to say thanks. To, I can't say enough thanks to him because, uh, funnily enough, I was playing around with this stuff. But when I kind of took it to the next level, he he was busy on a production in Mongolia, and we kind of started talking there. And he motivated me a lot. And I, at that point, he was. I mean, I I get starstruck when I when I see any of these people at any of the shows. Ra and hmm. and RC Cohn and and the guys from Feltzel, I mean, I look up to them and, and will always uh, have a lot of respect for them. But um, a guy like Chris Patterson um, from Confluence Films, there's, mm-hmm. the, I mean, the list goes on. <laughs> but uh, honestly, I think the guys work really hard. And, um, you know, I, I like I like all of it. Sometimes I think I probably uh, try and do a little bit too much. But, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's guys in the industry also like Oliver White and, and David Mangum and – and a good friend of mine also that I from South Africa, Christian Pretorius. And there's, there's a lot of guys that, uh, that, that now that even though we all fishing together, I mean, Blaine chocolate is another guy mm-hmm. that I can't give enough, uh, mm-hmm. enough, yeah. enough respects to with all the stuff he's done within fly fishing, his creative fly tying methods. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, I, hope, I mean, I've, I've probably missed a bunch of people, but <laughs> you know, the, 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 the there's there's a lot and i still thank all of them and when we see each other it's it's kind of weird sometimes now you hang out with these guys like like their buddies but you still respect and honor and everything they do and and if we can keep that thing going and get more people into doing it um like i said again it's for us for i've dedicated my whole life to fly fishing and um geez lucky i have a really good and understanding wife um i have to thank her Mm -hmm. too but uh uh I mean, I, I've dedicated my life to this industry and I'd like to see it keep growing and and for more people to be able to make a living doing it. Yeah. No, it sounds like, uh, yeah, I think it's continuing, especially with the stuff you're doing to help to get, to get the word out there. I think more people are going, well, it just seems like there's just more species and, you know, you see people over in Africa and kind of deep in the, the jungle and it seems like there's, you know, you can pretty much catch any species on a fly rod these days. So we're, we're kind of going for it. Is, is that how it feels to you? Is there, and is there anything left out there we haven't touched yet? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think there's places, you know, it's, um, I still, like I said, Africa, I still think, um, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff to be done there. Obviously safety could sometimes become a factor but i mean there's guys like uh, buddies of mine from south africa to reds fishing that that are busy doing the the most amazing groundwork they just uh they just uh gone went public with a location in cameroon that they were catching these absolutely giant nile perch in a little river system um and uh and it's all those and there's the goliath tiger fish um the guys are exploring a lot more. It's not necessarily fish that hasn't been caught on gear before, but just targeting these on fish on fly consistently, um, I think is amazing. And I mean, Australia is another place. Um, uh, we on the low down, we busy with, uh, at the end of July, we doing a project in Australia for the, the 2019 fly fishing film tour. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and there's, there's hopefully we'll be able to introduce the audience to a couple of, fish that's been caught by Australians, but it hasn't been given the recognition around the world about being these actual fish that you can target quite regularly. Um, and, uh, really excited about that. So it's, uh, I think we just have to keep pushing. And if, if I love it when somebody says you can't do it with a fly rod, cause then yeah. it gives me even more motivation to go and do it. So, and, and you, Potentially, you just have to. Sometimes it it seems impossible, but you just have to figure it out. And it's sometimes like beating your head against the wall. But if you beat hard enough, you'll get through it. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to get back into uh, GTs a, in a little bit here. But before I jump back in there, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, so you grew up in um, South Africa, and uh, that's great. And how long did you live there? Or are you still out there? 
So I, um, I've, I've lived, uh, well, uh, I, I grew born and raised in South Africa, finished, uh, uh, my marketing degree, uh, in the university of Johannesburg. And, uh, since then I can honestly say I've spent minimal time in South Africa. Um, I went to London after university and worked in the fly shop and then okay. guiding and gotcha. have been guiding. Uh, I think my most guiding days was 320 days in, 2012 and that means like yeah i mean when you get back home you don't even appreciate being home you just go and sleep <laughs> for the rest of the time you've yeah. got left um uh, but uh been traveling since then and and the reason um we moved to the u.s uh, uh, uh a couple a year or so ago um and the reason just being is because the industry is is very big yeah and it's easier for me to connect with people and yeah. uh and it's uh, it's great. The industry's it's massive, yeah. And it, it I, I can honestly thank, um, yeah. It's it's great. Be, it's um, it's, gonna this my, makes you realize how big it actually is. Yeah, yeah. No, that was yeah. going to be my my next question, just on the difference between you know South Africa and the U.S. Obviously, there's a lot going on, you know, in the U.S. But you know, there is a you know there is a market over there. It's just it's just not as big. And you mentioned the U.K. as, as well. I mean, obviously that that's a big market, but um, yeah, there's just, you know, as far as getting over, and I think you're in Connecticut now. Is that where you guys, is that your home or? We recently bought a home in Austin, Texas. Oh, so okay. now we live in, in, in Austin and have since last year, August, um, and we're loving it. Yeah, it's cool. uh, it's amazing. Uh, I've got a, quite a few friends. There's other South African friends that live with us nice. here too. And, uh, and um, I, I work with Yeti coolers a lot, so it's nice okay. to be close and some good friends out there. And uh, yeah, it's a it's an amazing place. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, we're uh, yeah, we're all over the place with this uh, this interview, but I kind of like it because you got a lot of you know a lot of uh, interesting uh, background here. And <laughs> I always like to ask a question about you know, and you're you know 35, you know, pretty young still and all that. But is there you know looking back in your your life and kind of is there a a story that sticks out that helped to to you know get you to where you are and you know kind of seems like leading the way in some of this stuff jeez i i, I kind of think where where it, it it changed quite a bit is um it was probably in 2012 when i i filmed the the gt uh a lot of the gt stuff throughout a season and made a little film clip for a south african film festival um and it did pretty well there and then i flew to norway in june and then I got a, uh, an email from Tom Bai from the Drake, and mm -hmm. he, um, he 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 asked me if I could do a, a similar clip, uh, maybe less uh, less. Honestly, he said less talking because nobody could understand <laughs> South Africans. Yeah. So uh, I cut it down a little bit, uh, made it a little bit more action packed, compact, and uh, and look. I mean, honestly, I was I was guiding at that stage eighteen hours a day. So whenever I had an hour or two off, I'd be sitting editing that clip and. And, and just almost never slept, maybe slept with my eyes open when I was standing next to the river. <laughs> and that went on. I did for about two weeks, got the clip back to Tom, and it uh, ended up winning Best Fishing Award at the Drake oh, Awards, right. which was kind of the, the swing uh, with regards to the filming and just, just being out there and introducing people to these things um, that what, what we are doing. So um, that, that was kind of a big change, and uh, I'll, ne I'll never forget that. Um, but I know when somebody asked me, uh, again about how to reach this point where it's now i, I just say to them look honestly there's the, the, for me there's no trust fund involved i put my head down and i yeah. worked every single moment when i got back from a season i was either editing photos videos speaking to uh industry people non-stop so there wasn't a point where this was going to be my living and i was going to make it work hmm. that's that's great advice and i was ta uh, ta oh, i interviewed a while back um uh, Steve Duda from the uh, Fly Fish Journal, and uh, we were talking about the same thing. Yeah. You know, he he has lots of people that you know try to that want to write for him for them, but it's you know tough to get in there. And you know that's the bottom line. If you want it bad enough, you just got to put your head down and just just go all in. So that's 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 cool to hear that. Uh, pretty much, you're at you're at you know you're where you are because of a lot of hard work. So that's a good good lesson for lots of people. Yeah, honestly, I mean, there's for me in life, there's no shortcuts. You um, you got to do it right, and you got to work hard for it. And it's, I mean, it sounds like a cliche because I I always admire when you just see all these 
uh, people around the world and famous people. And I, th I don't think people sometimes realize the hard work that a lot of those people do, uh, whether it be like, I mean, somebody that's always interested me is, is somebody like Dwayne Johnson. And I follow his, just sees motivation and how, how hard he works. And, and it's easy to look by it when somebody's that famous, but it, it takes any, any of that stuff. When you, when you want to be in fly fishing or in the fishing industry, you got to realize it's going to come with a lot of hard work. And yeah. sometimes it's not going to be, like I said, when you're guiding, you, it, sometimes you become the unsung hero because you do a lot of stuff uh, outside of just showing people fish and helping them get their fish of a lifetime. But uh, it is fantastic, and, and, mm -hmm. and it is a dream job. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a... Uh... That's cool. I love, love the story. Uh, so let's get back to uh, GTs a little bit. Just on, you mentioned the rod and the gear. So what if you want to go out, if somebody's getting ready for a big trip, what's the, you know, rod, uh, reel, line, and the setup they need to get, and just kind of the kind of the general gear for salt? Yeah, look, I, um, so when it comes to, to the, uh, to the GT fishing, um, usually I would recommend an 11 or 12 weight, uh, rod, just depending on how advanced caster you are. Because, uh, um, if you're not most more, if you're not the most advanced, uh, caster, then a 11 weight is po possibly a little bit better. Um, the reason being, you, the reason why you can also still use the 11 weight is because a lot of the times when you're fighting the fish, the rod never goes above your shoulders. You, you fight them low and dirty. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, um, a matching reel the it the drag system on reels are are, are really really important mm -hmm. you can't you can't do any half measures if you go for gts you need to be 100 percent confident that the drag system on your reel is very good uh there's quite a lot of different uh, good brands uh, out there um, i've been with nautilus for a long time oh, yeah. amazing reels and recently recently just signed up with mako reels that mm. was designed by jack Cholton, and they are just mm -hmm. absolute machines uh, they are crazy hmm. drag systems on the on the reels and and uh and then just a uh, good backing um i i tend to now go for thicker backing than than a thinner diameter and put more and so i would put less line on my reel and thicker backing oh, the yeah. reason being if you've got a gt running out 200 yards yeah uh you're already in trouble <laughs> but that fish is going to go around coral so then i'd rather have it being stronger and being able to to hold up against that abrasion than uh, something that's thinner and allows me another 400 yards. Sure. And then just a matching fly line, um, uh, a matching 12-weight uh, tropical fly line or 11-weight tropical fly line. Um, if you can get a, a line with a very strong core, uh, we've also worked with uh, a couple of various brands in the past and currently work with Cortland. Uh, on oh, a wow. and, and they, they've got a GT tuna line, and that is – that is the business. We it, it's cool. a it's a bit of a thicker tapered line, so it turns over the GT flies nicely, whether it's in wind with wind, uh, because you're always going to deal with wind on the tropical locations, which is a good thing because then you can get closer to fish. Um, and then uh, a good leader material. Uh, we used to use we usually use 130 pound uh, monofilament or 100 mm -hmm. pound uh, fluorocarbon, mm -hmm. and then just, uh, whatever your fly of choice is. Um, I like natural fibers on a, on a fly just because I think it moves better. It doesn't last as long, but it definitely pulsates and vibrates in the mm -hmm. water a little bit better than synthetics. But you know, it's synthetic flies are also, I mean, they're great. There's a lot of, a lot of, you get a lot of use out of a single fly. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's the, the straight up GT setup and make sure your knots, uh, usually wherever I've guided at, uh, we'll go through the client's tackle, start ripping off fly lines, just seeing where the connections are, making sure all those connections are right, uh, redo loops, redo everything. Um, some of them take offense uh, because they've been working on it for yeah. months, but we definitely have a recipe, so we so we like to follow that recipe that works. And um and then, uh, usually apart from the GT rod, we always have a, a nine weight or a 10 weight, eight to a 10 weight rod with us, um, with a tropical floating line backing just for the other species, okay. permit, triggerfish, bonefish, gotcha. um, and yeah, wh whatever's there. So, um, hmm. so then we just go through those rods and, and, uh, and, uh, and enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and you mentioned fly. So now what do you have a couple of patterns that you might, uh, note here we can provide a link or something and some names that work they use that you go to 
Um, uh, usually the go-to fly has been for quite a long time in the Seychelles has been a brush fly, um, in various colors, uh, uh with, with it, a lot of the times the guys would go for a darker fly, um, in general, but if I fly fish turtle grass, darker bottom, I'll fish a, a darker fly. And if I fish over sand, I'll fish change maybe to a lighter fly, a tan or an olive, um, depending depending on what's happening but usually like i said we've been lucky enough to fish at places where the fish are not uh, that spooky but if you're fishing a place for example like christmas island that's had more pressure yeah it could be worth doing a, a game changer that's got maybe more movement uh or uh in a tan color or something that you can present um gts learn and they are very intelligent fish so mm. uh d don't be fooled by the only reason why they're trying to kill your flies that they've they're in a bad mood all the time, but they can also be in a bad mood where you don't move the fly. I've seen clients cast the fly on top of a fish's head and surprised that the GT spooks, but my response is always I've never seen a, a mullet attack a GT. So yeah. they still understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um so yeah, those flies, the 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 brush flies or the sem semper fly, that's always a good go to. Um and then for surface, the Nyap and the Reaper has been the two sort of go to flies. Um and great flies. Uh I just try to normally tend to stick with streamers because I have seen a lot of big fish push because they push such a big wake when they come and eat the fly, they can sometimes push the popper oh, yeah. out of the way. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but it's it's fun to see that thing come with its mm. head out and look you straight in the eyes when it eats your fly. Wow, wow, that's intense. Do you have any? Do you have any videos of the the fish coming straight at you eating your fly? Uh, there could be some in gangsters of the flat. It's hard. I haven't had any chances really to film really super tight close ups. Yeah. Um, but uh, there is in some of those. There could be uh, just glimpses of it of it happening. I wish. I mean, sure. to me. That is the money shot. Is trying is seeing GT close up, just put it push its head out. I mean, any client that's fished that would would stay with them forever. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's cool. Uh, I I was uh, I, I was just thinking of uh, some of the brands, you know, Yeti and some of the comp companies you uh, you work with. You mentioned we, we've talked about a few here. Is there another? Is there a piece of gear, you know, whether fly fishing related or not, that you just is kind of thing you have to have used throughout, you know, the day throughout the year that you'd recommend for somebody? Um, look, honestly, uh, for me, with all the places that I traveled to, uh, if my things need to be waterproof. So a waterproof bag for me is is the, probably one of mm -hmm. my most essential tools that I have because that mm -hmm. means it keeps my camera safe, it keeps my laptop safe, it keeps my 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 flies out of my 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 tackle out of the salt. It it really um, uh, waterproof uh, gear is is essential. Um, and uh, I mean. Um, Jeez, there's, I mean, you can go on the sort of the go-to stuff that I usually use, but that uh, yeah. waterproof bag is a big one. Do you, um, do you have a, uh, a a company that you like to, to use that you'd recommend for somebody that need, wants to get a nice big – I know there's a bunch. I mean, we have a ton, NRS and lots of local companies that are great here, but I don't know if you had one that was a better one for you. Yeah, look, I mean, we've been using the, the, the Panga bags by Yeti recently, and I, it's, it's hard to beat them. They just made – bulletproof i've taken those things into the most terrible conditions and now they've released the backpack which is which is just as nuts we've been testing them for about a year now and and the funny thing is is with with those yeti products in all honesty you know people start going nuts about the price but they just need to look yeah. at the competitor's price and they'll see that that's kind of the going rate and you get what you pay for and sims also i mean i've worked a long time with sims and yeah. really enjoy the stuff that they do and uh, and make and they've I've had some good waterproof bags with them and mm -hmm. their, their their clothing and waders are still it's hard to beat a, a good pair of Sims Sims uh, waders to me I've uh, wherever yeah. I've gone that's not tropical those those have saved my life yeah that's cool yeah that's a good uh, yeah. definitely I'm, I think all of us out there can can use another good waterproof bag I've probably got too many <laughs> myself but uh, do, do, you, do you have a um, so Yeti, I was just going to make a note on, on the Yeti stuff. I mean, I think the cool thing about that company is they are doing an amazing job with their videos, which is cool that we're talking about the videos. But if you look at follow them on social and kind of all the stuff they're doing, they're like, they're probably a good company to, to, 
to follow and just see what they're doing because I think what they're doing is is the right way to do it. Um, I'm not sure if you get it. I guess they have good products as well. I haven't used a lot of their products, but it sounds like you're you're totally into it. Yes, yeah. No, I mean it's 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 quality products. It's uh, and and their design team really makes sure that and there's more stuff coming. They're always for forever developing and. The, the key thing about the company is, is that, that they give back. I mean, they get back to the outdoor industry. Mm. Um, they, they get these movies made. They, they get involved with it. And, and they, they just want to, again, they, they're really into building the outdoor industry. Um, so, so I admire them for that. It's not always uh, the easiest thing to just keep your marketing rolling like that. But they do an amazing job and, and definitely – and they back their products, yeah. back all of it for, for quality. Um, so, so I mean, I've they've they've been great to work for, and uh, and always enjoy hanging out with the team and seeing the new stuff. You no, know, whenever I go to the office and we go to the to the um, the the area where they design new stuff, it's like a kid in a candy store. All the new stuff that they come up with, it's uh, it's mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's sometimes yeah. it's for for as a sorry as, yeah um, as an ambassador that's the one thing I love uh, being part of just some of that development phases like uh, with with Thomas and Thomas Fire Rods I I definitely enjoyed just being being getting more involved with the with the development of the the Exocet mm. Fly Rod mm-hmm. and and just going through those emotions where okay this one's right. Now we need to get one that's this next. So, like we 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 found the right ten weight, and then we had to mold the the, the whole the rest of the series throughout that, and just to see how the design team goes, uh, how they go to work, and and how it ends up being the product that goes on the shelves. The, all the R and D, it's it's phenomenal. It's frightening. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I guess that's uh, the good companies. They know what they're doing as far as the R and D. Um, I was I was just thinking I uh, we're getting pretty close here to wrapping this up. I had a few more questions, one to touch base on before we uh, before we let you get going here. But do you have a so for somebody going for GTS? Is there a good resource you would send them to, either a book or a magazine online, any sort of resource to help them get prepared for a big trip or learn about it? Um. You look, honestly, uh, the guys that I've worked with that that is just a giant source of information. Um, uh, is either um, Alphonse Fishing Company themselves? They try and do. Uh, they try and more now give information on these specific locations and what you can expect and what you would need. Um, and then obviously uh, uh, a, a, a company um, I've been working with Yellow Dog uh, Travel mm-hmm. for a long time now. And honestly, um, the one thing that people don't understand about how the this whole the industry works is. If you can use an, uh, a company like Yellow Dog um, and you would pay what you pay for the trip and you get all the information and everything that goes along with it, they prep you from beginning to end. You literally, before the trip, you know exactly where to be, what time to be, what tackle you need to have. Right. It, it is it is invaluable. Mm. And um, also, the, like I said, I've seen a lot of the companies now, for example, Yellow Dog doing these little um, – these videos that's just more educational on what you can expect. One of the one of the greatest ones I see saw recently was was uh, one that Oliver did uh, with Yellow Dog about Cuba, where as you get this amazing location, but what people don't realize is that it uh, it, it 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 time could be you're going to a place where you have to accept that things are late or the food is not the most magnificent. The fishing could be great, but you need yeah. to expect X, Y, and Z. And Sometimes people just see the videos, which is amazing, and that's what what sells it at the end of the day. But they still need to understand what could go wrong. Yeah, the yellow dog for sure. Yeah, they're that's a great resource. Just uh, search for any of the species we were talking about, and there'll probably be a resource on their site um, to dig into. So that's a good one. Um, do you have, as we kind of get close to wrapping this up, uh, a trip? I mean, this is probably a hard one for you, but do you have a trip or a moment out there fly fishing somewhere in the, in the salt that is kind of one of your, your memorable ones that you could share with us? Oh, uh, th- there's one that will haunt my dreams forever that happened quite recently. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, there's, there, you, there's a lot of moments, especially when you're guiding, you're out on the water so much that you um, – that you just keep creating these memories and and uh one in particular 
you know, the big fish getting away is one that will, it will forever stick with you. It's, yeah. it's hard because now you make up, you've made up your mind how big you think the uh, fish is. It could be 10 pounds. It's, it's 20 pounds now. Damn. So, um, I just on this recent trip to Cuba, I haven't caught, I've caught quite a few Indo Pacific permit and guided a lot of clients onto them, but I've never caught an Atlantic permit. And we had a fantastic trip to open fishing and, uh, we were lucky enough to, to spend some time for permit and, uh, I had a chance at a few that followed and did the permit thing. And uh, eventually I had the single fish made a cost, which I was pretty happy with, landed in. The fish crushed the fly and just started running. And I felt slowly, well, it felt like, like I don't know, ages, but the line wrapped up around my leg and the, the fish just smoked me and snapped the line. Oh. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it was just a blind stare in my face. I, I will never forget it because – it's just that this really happen. It's you've waited for that moment for so long and you made it happen. And then it, it happens like that. And it's nobody's fault. It's, it just, it's part of fishing. And I don't think I'll forget that moment for, uh, for a very, for a very long time. But, uh, you know, when you're guiding, that's the, the, the kicker about that is the reason also why it's such a satisfying job is it's, uh, it's, you know, it's like when you go outside and you cut the lawn and it, it could be hard that day. It's hot outside. And you look mm -hmm. back and it looks pretty awesome. It's the same when you have a client and he's excited about catching his first GT and, and you want it for him just as much as he does. And you go through all those emotions and then you make it happen. <laughs> and, uh, man, it, it is, it is a very, very rewarding job. Um, but I also remember I had a client, uh, one week that was the only person that, had not caught a GT for the whole week. I had him on the last day. Yeah. I was moving him around on the boat because he wasn't as agile on the flats and had him lined up with two GTs. He made the cost, did everything well, got the strip set in, set the hook, the line started ripping, and a tag end of his shirt was hanging out. Oh. And the line wrapped around that and popped him. Damn. And – I I don't get frustrated with clients or anything. It, I I would rather go and cry myself to sleep than try and show too much emotions. But uh, man, that was a tough uh, one to eat because he was a he's a great guy. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, he'll, he'll, it's a lot of those. Yeah, so uh, hopefully, I guess the, those. I would say I, I, I fish a lot for steelhead, and yeah, you don't forget about that last fish you lost until you get that next one on. That's, yeah, then it kind of erases a little bit of the memory but all right well what, what about uh you know you fish for we've talked about a bunch of different species do you have uh, something on your bucket list you still you want to get to that you know before before you're all finished up here you haven't fished for yet um shoot, honestly the the i really love uh, being in the states because there's a lot of species around and i can understand why a lot more people don't travel outside of the u.s because there's so many opportunities uh, around um, but in, in saying that I do, apart from the saltwater stuff, I like jungle fishing. Um, so definitely a target species of mine that's right on the top. There's that giant arapaima, which, uh, which I, uh, will be doing at some point pretty soon, okay. um, which I'm very excited about. Um, but, um, and all in, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this trip to Australia because there's a, there's quite a, a handful of fish that I haven't been able to target that aren't the easiest, but very rewarding to catch. And, uh, and yeah, so, yeah, so that bucket list never ends. Like, you know, it just, <laughs> no. uh, it's just, it just keeps filling up and, uh, you have the next one and the next one. But, uh, I'd say the giant arrow palm is probably my first up on the list now. Okay. I'd look, I mean, honestly, steelhead, uh, having done a bit of Atlantic salmon fishing, yeah. I know steelhead to me is also still right up there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned that you had, uh, you, you did some tarpon fishing. Uh, I've done quite a bit of top and fishing throughout the, the, the recent years. Cause I was involved in a project called Atlanticus, which is on the fly fishing film tour this year where okay. we fished a couple of different locations. Uh, we fished this jungle river where we were 140 miles away from the ocean and these giant hundred to 150 pound top and rolling in a river. That's nothing wide. It's some places. Wow. I mean, it's, it's some places it's 60 feet across. Oh yeah. That. Yeah. And, no, I, um, I watched yeah, those it, videos. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. The, um, so, um, so yeah, it's, they are a really great fish to fish for. They do have it all. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, 
Well, Yaku, I think we're about there. Maybe just let me know, uh, let everybody know here in the next uh, six months. I guess you talked about a few things. You got Australia coming up. Anything else you want to let us know you have uh, new coming up for yourself or any of the, the stuff you have going on? Uh, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's this Australia one. And um, soon after that, I'll be going to Kamchatka for the first time for oh, wow. a couple of weeks and uh, um, and then have uh, a trip to Bolivia, Tanzania, and uh, back to Cosmolito. Um, and then just a lot of uh, trying to just get myself um, – I've got a couple of mentors here, uh, JT Van Zandt and Alvin, um, that's, uh, that I'm going to be working with, uh, guiding on the coastline, yeah, and just uh, just just hoping and, and just trying to follow everything that they say and uh, and hopefully get, get uh, to take people out here on the coastline. Okay. Gosh, you're uh, you're definitely living the dream out there. I mean, you've uh, <laughs> yeah, you've done a lot. You're still heading out. I mean, what what would be your word of advice for somebody listening to this and that you know they want to they have dreams of fishing all those the spots we've talked about. Any any tips on whether that's you know getting out there doing it to, to help somebody? You know, honestly, like I mean, I do I do get the question quite often, and uh, I definitely say to anybody, look, I mean. Again, like I come from very humble beginnings. It's not nothing. Um, I've great parents. They've always supported, but we've never really had the kind of money which involved gets involved in fly fishing and mm-hmm. fishing these destinations. But definitely, don't let that get you down. Um, if you, you are adamant on doing it, uh, just really, really go after it. Um, it's it's not going to come easy. Whether it be if you wanted to go start when I started. Uh, when I started working in the fly shop, I immediately knew I wanted to become a guide. And that took me a long time. Well, it took me a year before of admin just being doing everything that everybody says to become a guide. And then um, and then when you want to do the next step and the next step, there's none of the places that, that I've fished is impossible for any other normal – any person can go and fish those. You just need to put your mind to it. If people want to find you or if they have questions, where where, uh, where should they uh, head as far as the website or social? Um, yeah, I, th- I think uh, best would be my link for my emails on my web, my new website, uh, CaptainJackProductions.com, um, and uh, or just Yahoo at CaptainJackProductions.com, and uh, you can also message me on Facebook and Twitter or Instagram. Uh, it might take me a little bit of time if I'm traveling, but I will get to it. If, it's, if I have not replied to it, it's going to happen within a couple of weeks, but it'll happen. Okay, and that's Captain Jack Productions is is C A P T uh Jack Productions dot com. That's it, yes. Yeah. And okay. there's there should be a lot of uh things to see on there also, but uh I'm always happy. If anybody has any questions or need any help with anything, I'm more than happy to help. Okay, perfect. And we talked about a bunch of uh links and uh companies and all sorts of good stuff. I'll have that all at wetflyswing dot com slash uh Yaku. That's J A K O. But um yeah, Yaku, I just wanted to thank you for coming on and, and sharing your uh, your knowledge here and talking about GTs and just your experience. I think a lot of people are going to find this helpful and insp- you know, inspirational like you talked about at the beginning. So just want to thank you for, uh, for coming on and sharing and, and hope to keep in touch with you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Dave. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Yaku. That's J-A-K-O. Please head over to the link uh, of that same link there and leave a comment on the blog post if you get a chance. And I just want to thank you again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to see you uh, online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.